AP World History. Well, good morning. What make a snow day even more perfect than some AP World History notes, right? Right? Oh, well. Well, we got to keep on schedule here, folks, because, again, we are uh, on our, well, you you know. We got basically three weeks a unit, and next week uh, gets us there. And so we got to wrap up on some notes this week, whether it's going to be in this way or with each other. Uh, we are getting down toward the end, so uh, I'm going to see if I can crank out about another eh, three, four slides here. Um, when we ran out of time, or a short little um, little bit of notes that we were able to take last uh, Friday, um, we were finish, finishing up on the effects of the transatlantic slave trade. Uh, I spent some time on that uh, big topic. And so uh, we had a, a couple that we had already talked about. Um, with A and B, but where I need to pick up is going to be, here we go, with uh, a, a few others that we'll uh, throw into the mix, okay? Um, dependence on uh, on European goods uh, is going to be one of those things that also is going to be a consequence of the, of the slave trade. Um, the, the, the more the more a any society was you know, deeply involved in the slave trade, the more dependent they're going to be. And we see this in particular, you know, with some of these uh, African kingdoms and uh, tribes that um, are, are a little bit more deeply involved with the, uh, the slave trade. Uh, we talked about uh, guns and, uh, and other manufactured goods that are coming out of Europe uh, over the stretch of time. Uh, many of those those Africans will become more and more dependent on those and kind of leaving themselves vulnerable uh, by that dependency, okay? Um, gives another area where Europeans can kind of exploit. And uh, when we when we look at the consequences of uh, the Industrial Revolution, we'll, we'll see that uh, play out. Uh, gender imbalance, if we're getting back to our uh, kind of, kind of our, our bigger list here of the... Uh, the the trade uh transatlantic trade sorry i think i'm still must still be still be kind of waking up even though i don't know um it, the slave trade does create you know as we talked about uh in class last week typically those who are being taken off the continent um it is it is it, it definitely leans heavily towards males and younger males and so that creates issues on the uh, the African continent where you you do end up with this gender imbalance in parts of Africa. Um, we'll see uh, polygamy become uh, very common in uh, in some African uh, cultures because of of the shortage of men. And so the idea that men will take on multiple wives uh, is a reflection of the fact that there just aren't enough men around for there to be these you know kind of monogamous you know relationships between two people. And so it has that kind of an impact. Um, and let's see, what else do we want to get in on that? Um, there we go. Uh, that can kind of fit in here as well. Uh, when we talk about uh, the impact on indigenous populations, let's look at this as uh, kind of like here we go. Um, so this idea of erasing peoples and cultures, uh, there's definitely, there's a, a lot of situations where, where artifacts are taken from Africa. And this is something that will continue all the way on into the, uh, into the 19th century um, and taken back to, hold on a sec here. Sorry, had to have a coughing fit. I don't think I'm sick, but then again, who knows? Um, anyhow, um, we we're talking about this, this erasure of culture. I think if I uh, jump down here, it kind of fits in with C down there as well um this cultural destruction uh and and you do end up in a lot of museums of europe uh with a lot of important african artifacts in there uh, artifacts that had cultural significance to the people that they were taking from and you know historians kind of go down different roads on this as far as you know what was the motivation uh was this a you know a deliberate effort towards cultural destruction um there's a good old quote from uh, from George Orwell of uh, Animal Farm in 1984 fame. You know, he said uh, the most effective way to destroy a people is to deny and obliterate their own understanding of their own history. I may be kind of paraphrasing him there, but you know, this idea that yeah, if you want to uh, erase a people, um, make sure their history disappears first, and uh, that kind of knocks out their foundations. And makes it uh, easier to uh, to conquer and control 
All right. And, uh, and like I said, we're, we're kind of in this kind of gray area here and we'll, we'll be focusing in far more on the, uh, the effects of imperialism in a, in a later unit. Um, but with B, even this idea that as time will go on and as Europeans begin to kind of sink their influences deeper and deeper into Africa, eventually we are going to see this, uh, this movement towards establishing full on colonies in Africa, Europeans being sent in to administer those colonies, um, make use of assimilation policies in terms of language and religion, you know, basically replace just all of the indigenous structures that had existed in Europe, in, excuse me, in Africa, and, and replacing it with uh, with European control, and pretty much all of it at the base of it for uh, for economic um, gain, um, you know, the, the natural resources that, uh, the African continent offered up. Uh, again, I'm not going to get too ahead of myself here because we're going to really pick it apart in unit, uh, six. Okay. All right. Let's go ahead and focus in, um, here completely kind of a shift gears in a, in a different kind of a topic. All right. Um, Oh, I'm going to cough again. Sorry about that. Well, no, I mean, actually, I'd be really sorry if you had to listen to me cough, but, um, oh, maybe I'm, uh, again, maybe I'm getting sick. I don't know. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll be taking some medicine when we uh, finish up here. Um, it's those dog walks, you know, when it's only, you know, Saturday, I think I was out walking dogs. We took a very short walk because I didn't want the little paws to get hurt. But, uh, but even then, even a short walk, it was like 14 degrees. I'm, I'm, you guys know what I'm talking about. Deal with it as well. Um, anyhow, I don't, I don't know. Maybe, maybe I'm catching something. Um, so let's talk about uh, the effect of, of all this maritime trade on belief systems. Uh, as we're seeing the expansion of these trade networks, um, yeah, there's going to be an impact on, on religious belief. Uh, and uh, that's what we're going to use this, uh, this next uh, part of the slide to uh, kind of uh, explain. Uh, what we're going to see is, you know, uh, again, one of the kind of natural consequences of all this trade is, again, we have all these different people uh, coming in contact with each other. And as we've uh, talked about before, um, when a lot of times we see this, this these, these cultural transfers, these cultural exchanges that are going on, um, a lot of times religion is going to play into that. And so, you know, we talked about spread of Islam, spread of other faiths uh, that are done in part through trade. And so we get a little bit of that mixed into uh, what we're talking about here, because again, we're, we're pretty much talking about expanding trade in, uh, in unit four. Uh, syncretic beliefs, uh, the word syncretic, when we talk about syncretic religion, syncretic faiths, that is the, the idea of, of combining different religions together uh, to create basically new religions. Okay. And so uh, we're going to focus uh, primarily on the, the religions that uh, a lot of the, the slaves uh, from that are brought out of Africa and brought to the Americas so that we have a nice little collection of some examples of how, again, how these trade networks, and in this case, particularly the transatlantic trade um, and, and slave trade network, how it has this impact on faiths, okay? Because we are, we're going to have Africans who uh, coming over uh, are going to bring their traditional uh, religious faiths, and then they're going to be blended with uh, the Christianity of the Europeans, you know, whether it be Spanish, whether it be Portuguese, whether it be British, um, you know, eventually American. Um, all of you, you're going to see these these new religions that uh, that are going to be created. So I'll give you a little, little rundown here and a little bit of... Uh, little bit of information uh, about each of them okay Santeria is uh, is gonna be a syncretic faith uh, that ends up being located in Cuba where a lot of the other uh, sugar industry is is located you'll see parts of it uh, in South America North America but uh, Cuba is kind of usually seen as kind of ground zero and uh, and this is one that uh, definitely has uh, some some African uh, kind of kind of roots uh, connected to it and uh, Santeria, by the way, translation, Way of the Saints, okay? Um, but anyhow, that's going to be a, a syncretic faith that uh, is created here out of the, uh, the slave trade. Vodun is, a, uh, is another one. And, uh, and, and this is one that uh, does have a little bit of almost, there's a kind of bit of that connection to voodoo, um, but, uh, but, but don't go too crazy on, on that. Um, this is one that comes out of the African Congo and, uh, and again, ends up in the Caribbean area practiced in, uh, on the island of Haiti. 
And so uh, Bodun, uh, another syncretic faith. Candomble, which uh, sounds kind of French, um, and uh, is is going to be um, actually one that comes out of, uh, it, it actually comes from uh, Portuguese, because uh, it's going to end up in Brazil, but starts among the Bantu people of Africa. And so many of the Bantu who were brought over here to, as part of the transatlantic slave trade um, are, are is going to be um, the the blending of, of some of that Portuguese uh, Catholicism and, uh, and and boom out comes uh, Condomble. Okay, so all three of those are going to be religions that are practiced by African slaves once they come over here to the Americas. All right, uh, syncretic faiths. Uh, we can also uh, look at uh, impacts from uh, sl the expanding slave trade uh, when it comes to uh, to Islam and uh, Catholicism. Um, and uh, the connection with these two faiths uh, still uh, connects back to the Americas. Um, it's going to be a very small percentage, but uh, you know we we talked back in uh, Unit Two, and uh, was mentioned again in Unit Three. But the uh, the spread of Islam into Africa uh, because of the Trans-Saharan uh, trade network uh, estimated about one out of every ten slaves brought to the Americas um, was already Muslim uh, from from that that spread of that diffusion of, of islam into africa prior to the slave trade and so while it's not going to be a, a significant presence in the americas there is going to be an islamic presence in the americas starting uh during the you know the the pretty much we're, we're looking at that point um the 17th 16th 17th centuries right in there that you start to see some of that Okay. When it comes to the spread of Catholicism in the Americas, we've also uh, touched on this as well. And uh, most of that is going to come through uh, missionaries, uh, Franciscans, Jesuits, uh, Dominican uh, missionaries, who all come to, uh, to the Americas um, to, in, you know, mainly to try to convert indigenous people. Uh, to uh, to to the various forms of Christianity, most of it. I mean, again, these are all we're talking about uh, orders uh, within the Catholic Church, and uh, and some of them will have some success. Um, particularly, um, there's no getting around the fact that you know uh, Mexico, Central and South America, uh, Catholicism was and still is a, a major presence, and that's where it comes from is the uh, the work of, of those missionaries. All right, and uh, let's see here. And, well, number three kind of just stands on its own, as in, yep, that's a fact. Um, you know, you're going to have uh, the, uh, the Spanish, um, who are Catholic. You're going to have England, who is largely Protestant. Same with the French. Um, there's always going to be a little bit of that religious aspect running in the background to some of the conflicts uh, that happen in the Americans, particularly between the Spanish and these other groups that are over here. But there's no getting around that is, you know, this empire building is going on uh, in the new world. Religion plays its role. All right. Okay. Big shift of the gears here. We'll look at uh, section six and uh, internal external challenges to state power. So, yep. Uh, while we're talking about all these these changes that are going on to various states because of the expansion of uh, of you know basically again ocean going maritime uh, trade, uh, we're we're going to see this kind of boomerang to uh, impacts that happen sometimes between countries, sometimes within countries and states. Uh, and so let's start off with just the uh, the basic idea: this uh, resistance to uh, to empires. Okay. And uh, first example we'll look at, we'll, uh, we'll take a look at Portugal and Africa. Um, this story is actually, it's kind of illustrative of, uh, of I think, a, a number of, of different things. Um, I mean, we we're already should be pretty well familiar with Portugal's um, involvement in Africa and the establishment of their uh, trading post empire down the West Coast, up the East Coast, all that kind of business. Um, but I, I think this this story also gets into uh, how Africans themselves that played their roles in the slave trade were were becoming um, far more advanced in in their understanding of of the way that politics worked, uh, playing off rivalries, that sort of thing. So instead of talking about, it, let's just get right into it. Um, 
what what comes to be called the uh, the Indongo Revolt in uh, in 1624 uh, is uh, going to take place um, and is going to uh, feature um, this lady right here, Anna Nzinga. She is a a queen that uh, that uh, rules over the uh, the Indongo people. Uh, the Indongo people are finding themselves increasingly under the control of the Portuguese as they become more and more aggressive in their demand for slaves and, you know, trying to manipulate and, and trying to control the slave trade uh, in, in various parts of, of Africa. And in particular, we're talking about, you know, the West Coast line there uh, is where this is all going to uh, to happen. Um, and Zingo will, will lead her people and rise up against the Portuguese. And uh, and what they'll what they'll end up doing is uh, is is allying themselves with one of Portugal's enemies, Netherlands, and so they create this alliance with the Dutch to fight against the Portuguese, and um, and and so you know again uh, this to me big example of of Africans they they they're figuring this out very quickly uh, as to how this is going to work, and uh, and so. You know, using them as allies, they're uh, they're able to uh, to de de defeat uh, basically to uh, kind of win their their own freedom. They end up uh, creating their own little state called uh, Matamba, and uh, and Nzinga is able to uh, to rule over it. And so, yeah, um, starting to figure out how to use uh, Europeans against Europeans, and you know, again, kind of exploit what they're beginning to understand are the conflicts that exist between some of the different Europeans, all right? Uh, an example of internal um, a challenge is going to come from Russia and uh, is going to get us back to uh, the world of Russia that uh, is where, where most of the hard work is done by the, the serf part of their, of their social structure. Um, the serfdom, the way it had had progressed over the years in Russia, um, pretty much is like you have there. I mean, it was a state of slavery. And and pretty much um, the people were bound to the land. Um, they did not have the freedom to, to pick up and go where they where they wanted. The punishments were severe for any kind of um, you know, resistance by the serfs. Uh, it, it was a very, very oppressive system that the uh, the Russians were using, and uh, a lot of it, as they're as they are advancing as a country and their population is growing, the demand for grain is growing, and and the serfs are the ones who you know uh, make sure that that grain is available uh, for the growing population, and so that is going to be the state of things until uh, Yamelia uh, Pugachev uh, comes along. And putting together a bunch of those Cossacks that we uh, that we've already learned about this kind of this warrior culture going all the way kind of back to the Mongols uh, that exists within the, uh, the Russian population uh, is able to organize a, um, a a revolt, and this is going to be a revolt that you know while it's going to be Cossacks that are going to be kind of the soldiers um, that are going to be uh, doing the doing the fighting, it's being done on behalf of the serfs. Okay, that that's where uh, Pugachev looks to get his support. Is you know he's pretty much arguing that we are going to uh, revolt. Uh, this is against at that point in time, Catherine the Great was the uh, the leader of Russia, and we are going to uh, we are going to win you you know serfs uh, independence or more freedoms. What you know something to improve their lot in life, um, and so they do. They revolt against the uh, the Russian government, and. Um, it doesn't work out too well. Um, Catherine is use, able to use her armies to uh, to crush the uh, the revolt, and uh, what comes to be known as the Pugachev Rebellion uh, ends up being pretty short lived. And the result of it, the big result coming out of it, beyond that, is that Catherine becomes even more oppressive against the other uh, serf population. And so, where where the serfs had uh, chosen to line up behind this guy in the hopes of a better life. Um, when the dust settles on the whole affair, things are actually worse for them. And then uh, flip it over to uh, the Mughals uh, in India, and I know we're just we're just jumping all over the place. The, the usual the usual college board routine here. Um, 
So, you know, again, another one that I'll just remind you we should be pretty well versed in is uh, the idea that the leaders of the Mughal Empire were Islamic, while the vast majority of the population uh, was Hindu. All right. And we would talked before about, you know, how, uh, you know, Hindus had revolted against uh, Aurangzeb. And, you know, and so there there is this history of this this tension and that sometimes that, that things would uh, would would boil over. Um on this one, by the time we're getting into um, the late, late 1600s and going into the early 1800s, matter of fact, here, let's just click this up here. There we go. Uh, Hindus uh, are going to revolt uh, again, and uh, and this time they're going to uh, revolt around a warrior society. They're going to be the ones who uh, who, who lead this, uh, a warrior society called the Maratha. And uh, the Maratha are, are going to be the leaders. Um, they aren't able to completely, totally like overthrow the Mughals, but they are are viewed. They they do establish their own Maratha Empire um, that, as you can see there on the map, is going to basically overtake the, the vast majority of what's going to be India. The Mughals will hang on to little bits and pieces, but um, this is going to be another one of those one of those contributors to the the fall of the the Mughal Empire. That and the increasing pressure coming in from European countries and the uh, the British East India Company, uh, you put all that together. That's that's going to really give us the reason why the uh, the Mughal Empire will will dissolve. Okay, so there we go. Little little bit with them again. A little bit more. Another example of some uh, internal uh, issues that are that are going on there um, as far as challenges to uh, to state power. All right. What else do we have here? Oh, we can uh, jump it over yeah, to Spain and the Americas. Sure. What, what do we want to cover with this? Um, there's definitely some uh, challenges coming to, uh, back at the Spanish. You know, it's just it's that truism, folks. You know, I mean, people don't typically choose to uh, to want to be oppressed and controlled by you know by others. I mean, um, it's uh, we we could argue that it uh, is a a almost a natural human trait. Uh, to uh, to want freedom and self determination, and so it shouldn't be too surprising when we see these revolts and uprisings uh, happen by people who are either being controlled or attempted to be being controlled by outsiders. Um, so uh, some of the problems that Spain is going to end up facing, a lot of it has to do with their policy of forced conversion, uh, where they are in various parts of the Americas uh, to the indigenous populations, pretty much saying you will become Catholic uh, or you die. Um, you know, not given all, not given a, a whole lot of, of choice on that, and uh, and and there's going to be sure there's going to be plenty of indigenous people. I mean, again, we can we can look at uh, you know um, Mexico, Central, South America, and and obviously that that conversion worked in many 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 cases. That and the work of the missionaries, uh, but not always. And the Pueblo Revolt uh, in 1680 would be an example of uh, of the pushback uh, that could happen sometimes. This is where Pueblo and Apache tribes. Uh, revolted against um, the the Spanish, and actually their their revolt was was for a while was successful, um, temporarily successful. They did the the Spanish did end up retreating. Um, they they were chased and uh, had to base pretty much take about the next uh, dozen years to regroup and then uh, bring in a larger military forces to uh, go back in and and basically reconquer. Uh, that part of uh, your present day Southwest United States um, and to uh, put their control back over it. Uh, but that revolt, you know, part of it, just the basic freedom question as far as being controlled by outsiders, but part of it uh, also out of that policy of uh, forced conversion. All right. And then let's see, let's take a look at uh, what's uh, going on in uh, the Americas. Let's see, we've got, uh, oh boy, we have, um, we have slave revolts all over the place. And then again, it's just, you know, are, are we surprised? No. Um, the uh, the Maroon Wars, as they came to call them, the, uh, the Maroons were a, a, a group of uh, free slaves. Um, and many of them were escaped slaves in Jamaica who had uh, escaped and kind of established their own kind of, kind of almost uh, underground <clears throat> communities. And, uh, and they organized themselves and uh, and then and then we're able to uh, to basically rely on on other slaves in Jamaica to uh, to help to to fight this revolt. And as you can tell from the years there, that's uh, that's not a typo. Um, it's going to be this ongoing 
kind of, you know, real violence flaring up and then boom, you know, back under control, um, that sort of thing. And, and that's going to be fought off and on. Uh, eventually the, uh, the revolt will, will eventually be defeated. Um, but uh, an example, again, another example of, uh, of uprisings. Okay. If we go a little further north into, uh, into North America, um, we, we can look at the, uh, the Gloucester County Rebellion, 1663. So this is after the establishment of, of most of our 13 colonies. Most of them are, are up and running. And this was um, actually um, a slave revolt, um, more or less kind of a, a plot that involved not only slaves, but also uh, white indentured servants. And, um, and a, another one that's going to be, uh, you know, initially, uh, initially successful, um, and, and then, and then struggle to maintain itself. Suddenly had a, had a, had a brilliant idea. It's like, wait a minute. No, Gloucester, you're mixing up with another. Um, the Gloucester rebellion, uh, was the rebellion actually, sorry, that never really happened. Um, the, uh, the leaders of, of this, um, everything else I told you, yeah, I mean, a combination, dentured servants, slaves, but they, they didn't get out of the, the plotting part of the revolution. They were not actually able to, uh, truly carry out their, their rebellion. Um, just prior to them launching it, um, they, it was discovered, the plot was discovered and, and when they tried to, uh, uh, to carry it out, uh, basically they were the, the, those in power were prepared for it and uh, squashed it, got basically right out the gate. So there, there was no initial success. It was just, boom, uh, the rebellion that really wasn't a rebellion in the end. Okay. But again, we can use an example of, uh, you know, again, of, of resistance. Um, Metacom's War, also known as King Philip's War. Uh, Metacom was his, uh, was his indigenous name, King Philip was the name given to uh, to uh, this uh, this chief of uh, the tribe, and this is Native Americans now who uh, are are fighting back uh, against what they see as loss of territory, and this was fought against uh, uh, the British, and uh, and you got your your years there. Um, you know we're we're going to find with uh, with a number of of these wars that um, kind of that that idea that you know as far as as success. A success in Metacom's war was complicated by the fact that some uh, Native American tribes sided with the British. Um, they felt it was in their best interest to uh, stay on the British, stay on their good side. And so um, Metacom's war was not able to unite tribes in the way that uh, it had hoped to. And this ultimately doomed uh, this war to, uh, to failure. And, and it was kind of one of those additional steps in the British being able to uh, to establish you know, increasing control over their over their thirteen colonies by by removing the the threat that came from uh, the indigenous population. And let's see what else do we have? The Glorious Revolution. This is going back. This is one that doesn't happen over here in the colonies. All that's going to have the impact on the colonies. Um, but uh, this is a uh, an internal, and uh, I guess an example of, of again what we'd call um, an internal challenge back over in England. And uh, this is when uh, the Catholic King James the Third was overthrown by uh, by Protestants by uh, by William and Mary um, was a uh, was a basically a, a more or less kind of a a peaceful revolution, but uh, is is kind of going to for for that point on forward going to break the power of uh, the Catholic Church in um, in England, um, even though it's going to pretty much permanently settle the question of, of religion and political power in England. I mean, there, there never would be another Catholic king after that. Um, it still kind of accentuated the fact that, you know, there's just this tension uh, that uh, continues to, uh, to exist in uh, different parts of, uh, of the world. All right, let's see. What else do we want to cover? You know what? I know we're right about, about 30 minutes. And so I think we're going to call this a, uh, a good place to uh, to call it. Matter of fact, I think we only have one section left. So I'm going to keep my fingers crossed. I'm actually going to be able to cover that with you in person. And I kind of prefer to do these notes in person. Um, but we'll have to see. We'll have to see what uh, what the weatherman is going to bring us tomorrow. Um, all that good stuff. So um, 
until then, stay warm, stay safe, and uh, miss you guys. Um, see you soon. Bye.